Okay, we left off talking about measures of jitter and shimmer, and I'm gonna try to do this live because why not take risks when you don't need to? So um, I'm gonna try to produce vowel ah in modal, creaky, and then breathy voice, which we haven't talked about yet, but it'll still be useful. So I'm gonna show, um, let's uh, produce them first, and then we'll look at the different measures of uh, voice quality afterwards. So here we go. Uh, uh, uh. All right, that was fun. Call it ah uh, three. Um, okay, so we'll take a look. Um, yeah, the creaky wasn't as random as I wanted it to be, but <coughs> we'll take it. So here's my modal voice. Uh, and I'll actually turn this off first and um, show you how you can do this yourself at home if you want to. Uh, so you can turn on pitch. Uh, we all have talked about that on numerous occasions before. So my uh, F0 is about 120 hertz. You'll notice that the pitch tracker kind of breaks here for the um, creaky voice because it's harder to get um, a good measure of thing, something that's happening at irregular intervals. Uh, breathy voice is also about 120 hertz or so. That's like we've said before, is about the average F0 for an adult male speaker. Um, I will also turn on the pulses feature in Prot. Uh, so if you go to this pulses tab and say show pulses, then all of a sudden you get these blue lines up here in the waveform, blue vertical lines where it's guessing that each glottal pulse is happening. So I'll zoom in uh, a little bit so you can kind of see what it's trying to figure out here. Uh, but where it gets these big spikes is where it thinks the glottal pulses are happening more or less regularly. Uh, yeah, so that's its best guess for that. And when I do that, when I have the pulses feature on, let's try to get a kind of regular section here. I can zoom in, or I'm just gonna select a region in that particular um, portion of the recording. And then I'll go to pulses and then say voice report. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I do that, uh, it tells me a lot of information about pitch and pulses and so on and so forth. Uh, then I also get measures of jitter and shimmer, which is nice. So we'll just look at the most basic one, which is the what's called the local measure. And like I said, these are defined as percentages. So like for jitter, it's the period deviation divided by the period duration. Um, yeah, on average, how long is your period? And of that, um, how much deviation do you get? And the answer is not much uh, for modal voice. It's about 0.324%. For shimmer, that's a variation measure or a percentage measure of uh, variation in amplitude for each glottal pulse and that measures a little bit higher here but it's 2.75 percent so keep those in mind 0.3 percent 2.7 percent we'll look at a section of the creaky voice part and get a voice report for that and boom these measures have gone up a lot so jitter goes up to 4.39 percent and shimmer is now at 22.675 percent uh, and also look at the breathy voice a little bit here, uh, that one. Um, so you can see a little bit of noise in here, which is kind of interesting. Otherwise, it basically looks like the um, modal voice, but a little bit quieter. Oh, I'll point out as well, as long as we're talking about this, I'll turn off pitch here. So this is a problem that, so a number of you speak in breathy voice uh, kind of by default when you're doing things like production exercises. So with breathy voice, we get this interesting phenomenon where we get this sort of phantom formant down at the bottom of the spectrogram, which is not really a formant. So let's see what Prot thinks about this. If I say show formant. So, so Prot's basically getting it. So this is F1 and F2 for my breathy voiced ah. Uh. Maybe F1 is about 670 hertz and F2 is like 1170, something like that. They're pretty close to each other as we, we expect, right? Uh, but I'm getting a phantom formant here, which looks like it should be F1, even though it's not. Uh, we know this because ah, F1 is relatively high. It's a low vowel. We'll talk about that more later. Um, but what is this? Just keep that in mind for now. Um, if we look at the voice report for this guy, we're kind of in between what we had for uh, modal and creaky voice in terms of both jitter and shimmer. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, there's also another measure here of um, noise to harmonics ratio. And as you can see, so breathy voice is kind of, well, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, it's kind of like uh, a voiced H, right? It's like a voiced fricative. So there's noise on top of the periodicity. <clears throat> and you tend to get more, a higher noise to harmonics ratio for breathy voice than you do for modal voice. So this is about 0.069. And if we go back to, not that way. 
we go back to the voice report for modal voice, and it's 0 0.012. Uh, so that's lower. Uh, that measure tends to be higher for um, breathy voice. Uh, we'll talk more about harmonics and so on and so forth in the second half of the class. I'm not going to dwell on it now. If that makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Uh, but jitter and shimmer are things I do want you to know. And just remember that those are going to be higher uh, for creaky voice than for modal voice. And usually for breathy voice, they're going to be somewhere in between. Another kind of related um, voice quality to tense voice, ventricular voice, creaky voice, uh, but also noisy is what's called harsh voice. So <clears throat> I get questions about this and I've seen a little bit about it uh, in the research or literature that I've read. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm going to give you just the basics here. Um, but at some point in this lecture, uh, somebody typically will ask about uh, like death metal vo vocals, uh, which why not? Uh, they're kind of fun. So back in the old days, I used to go out and watch music shows. That was like in a previous phase of my life. Um, and once I was in downtown Calgary watching a show with some friends uh, and the opening band was... I don't know if you want to call them death metal, but there's some sort of heavy metal band. Um, and they sang in what I think is harsh vo uh, voice quality. Um, and so I was so excited about it. I was like, I can use this for my class. And so I went up and asked them for a copy of their CD. And they looked very, um, you know, kind of annoyed that some dorky guy, dorky professor was asking them for their death metal CD, but I bought it anyways. Um, and now I have this brief little clip from their music that I can play for you. Yeah, let's crank that up because that's what metal music is for. Right. Uh, so that's one form of what people often think of as like death metal vocals. There's another form here, which I grabbed from YouTube uh, of a guy who's trying to demonstrate the way to do it. Okay. I'm not super 100% sure what this guy is doing. He's either getting his ventricular folds involved or possibly he's uh, producing what is called the esophageal voice, which is an interesting phenomenon as well. So uh, let's stop for a moment and talk about that. Um, you can produce phonation or something like it even without uh, having a larynx. So some people get in the unfortunate position where they have to have their larynx removed, uh, primarily if they have like laryngeal cancer, which uh, may be a side effect of smoking. Um, but they can still speak perhaps uh, and one of the ways they can do it is by producing airflow out of their their gut, their digestive system rather than from their lungs, uh, and basically having it bubble up uh, through the top of their esophagus, uh, which is what you do when you burp, basically. Uh, so if you can produce a sustained burp, maybe you can become a death metal musician. Yeah, when I was a kid, I used to know another kid who could you know, supposedly do the ABCs with that sort of belched voice, but we're not going to talk about that further because there's no need to. Um, harsh voice, going back to some old timey literature, has been described as a raucous voice quality uh, in the 30s. And basically, what you're supposed to get is uh, the fundamental frequency is going to be aperiodic, so that will give you lots of jitter or variability in time. Um, but articulatorily, harsh voice does not really add anything new to the voice quality parameters, it just increases the intensity of those already in operation. Uh, which is maybe why people think of it as something harsh. So harsh voice is supposed to give you excessive approximation of the vocal folds, which you can maybe interpret as high medial compression, high adductive tension. You're pushing things together as hard as you can. Um, harshness results from over tensions in the throat and neck. It is often, if not usually, accompanied by hypertensions of the whole body. Uh, so yeah, that also seems to fit the death metal mold. Harsh F0 is supposed to be typically above 100 hertz, 100 hertz, and creaky voice is uh, supposed to have an F0 of normally below 100 hertz. Otherwise, they're fairly similar. So these are, um, this is a diagram of harsh voice that I got from a text on it, with, which didn't have sound samples. And this is um, the spectrogram from our good friend uh, in the downtown Calgary metal band. Oh, come on. Yeah, so maybe it looks similar. There seems to be slightly less periodicity here. Uh, we looked at that spectrogram of the breathy voice awe that I produced, and it looks fairly similar to that, except it seems to have less kind of periodicity at the bottom. It's sort of more noise than uh, vocal fold vibration, as it were. Um, 
So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, this is maybe a voice quality that you use when you get angry and are screaming at somebody. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't come into play a whole lot. Um, and it might not actually be the best thing for you to produce um, on an extended or, you know, regular scale. Uh, so we'll move on to breathy voice, which I've already talked about a bit, but is fairly similar because we get this sort of noisiness in breathy voice as well. Um, so in vo a breathy voice, the story is that the vocal folds are basically remaining open to some extent. Uh, and they're going to kind of wave in the airflow coming up from the lungs. I'm going to show you a nasal endoscopy video for these as well. And they do seem to be coming together uh, a bit. So maybe there's a bit more to this story than um, this characterization um, provides. But either way, they're open. The vocal folds are more open than you typically get in modal voice or definitely creaky voice or tense voice. Um, and that's what gives us this breathy quality to it. Uh, so I've got some examples. I think this is... Peter Latifoged, producing an ah, similar to the way I produced it a second ago. Um, there's studies from a generation ago, basically, which uh, suggest or kind of document the fact that women typically use this voice quality more than men. Um, judging from the samples I get from 341 students, and like I showed you that spectrogram, uh, the Women in my 341 classes tend to use this more than men as well, but people have noticed that women are using creaky voice more uh, in the modern day and age, but you might be one way or the other. Uh, either way, kind of the classical stereotype of a female voice, um, used breathy voice. This is uh, Marilyn, Mon Marilyn Monroe from back in the day. Oh, I wouldn't mind to wear glasses. Or singing to President Kennedy. birthday to you. Yeah, so I'm sure nothing was going on there, um, but she was using breathy voice quality either way. Uh, the laryngeal settings for breathy voice, like you're not pushing your vocal folds together as tightly as you were for the other voice qualities we've talked about. So you're going to have low medial compression and low adductive tension. There's not much force towards the midline. The longitudinal tension, which controls F0, can vary because, you know, you can sing in it or just speak in it normally, so that can go up and down. What you do need to have, though, um, to get the vocal folds to kind of come together, uh, to some extent, is higher airflow. Uh, so you got to, that's why it's breathy, right? You're pumping more air out of your lungs and more of that is coming out of your mouth in the form of noise, basically. Um, so I've got a video of this uh, from the same speaker we saw before. My hard drive is starting to overheat. I hope I can get through this without having to split it up again. But even if I don't, we'll just make do. So here we go with this nasal endoscopy video. You can see the vocal folds won't come together quite as closely as we've seen before. First of all, normal and then breathy. E, e, e. Normal again. E, breathy. Yeah, so it just keeps coming at you like the monster from a horror film, but uh, you get the picture, I think. Hopefully, these vocal folds, you can see the gap between them, even when he's producing that voice quality. How does this translate to EGG? Uh, we can compare breathy voice and modal voice. And what we tend to see um, is that breathy voice has a very kind of short closed phase. And most of the time it's going to be open or at least partially open. And then it quickly closes and then goes back open again. Um, this also looks, it's not quite a sine wave, right? But it's looking a little more sine wavy than what we normally get for modal voice where we get these nice little angle peaks at the top and the bottom. Um, there's also, so because it's more sine wavy, it looks a little more symmetrical um, in terms of what it does in the open and closed phase. Uh, yeah, it takes a little bit of time getting closed because you're not pushing together, the vocal folds together quite as much. It kind of open quite easily down here. Uh, so there's an asymmetry there, but on either side of this peak, it's pretty symmetrical. Um, yeah, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, 
and I'll just say, I'll talk about this more after the midterm, but when you get a an EGG waveform that's more sinusoidal, uh, that's more sine wavy looking, then you are going to get more of an impression of that fundamental frequency, that low phantom formant in a spectrogram. I'll let you just think about why that might be the case without really explaining it here, but I'll come back to it again when we talk about um, harmonic structure and spectrograms in the second half of the semester. So this is me producing breathy voice with the EGG machine. And I think it looks fairly similar to what I just showed you on the previous page. This is the idealized form. And this is what I was actually able to produce with this little kind of upslope here down at the bottom, short, closed and open phases. And it opens up really nicely and easily. Um, this is me with my modal voice. A little bit quieter. I just probably didn't get as good of uh, contact um, with the machine when I was producing this one, but this has more structure in it, more peaked at the top and the bottom, uh, and a little less sinusoidal for that reason because we're getting more complex structure, a little more high frequency structure, I would say. The breathy one shows you basically the influence of the fundamental. Um, in the complex waveform. This one has a little bit more going on. Okay, so there are languages in the world which contrast modal voiced uh, segments with breathy voice segments. Gujarati is probably the most widely spoken one that I know of. It's to make sure, yeah. Gujarati, I'm pretty sure, is spoken on the west coast of India, but also in a variety of other places like Canada. Uh, I had some Gujarati speaking friends in high school, but down in Illinois, so yeah. Uh, they never explained this to me, so I'm going to explain it to you now. Um, they, uh, in Gujarati, have modal voiced vowels that sound like this. No. Sorry. No. And breathy voiced vowels, which are transcribed with two dots underneath the vowel, like this one. No. And I think you can hear that distinction if you listen closely. No. No. I will, however, add that I did have one student a while back who took this class uh, and study Gujarati has his um, course project language throughout the semester and didn't pick up on this. So it's pretty subtle, right? Uh, but if you listen closely, it's there. No, no. He was still a good student. I don't mean to give you a bad impression. Uh, there's also languages like Hausa, uh, which is spoken in West Africa, uh, which contrasts a modal voice yod with a creaky yod or say a glottalized yod, which has this kind of creaky uh, diacritic underneath it. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of a noisy um, recording, but I think you can get that contrast. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of sounds like a bit more tense voice quality in the ah here too, right? A bit like he's tightening up his larynx. Yeah. Okay, um, creaky voices, consonants are also said to be laryngealized or glottalized. I think I mentioned that before. There's also a language called Jalapa Mazatec, which is spoken in Southern Mexico, uh, down around Oaxaca or Veracruz, that has all three of these voice qualities. So it has the modal voiced. <laughs> has creaky voice and breathy voice. Yeah. Yeah, and I think maybe the breathy voice is more on kind of the aspiration after the D here. Uh, so we've got other examples of that also from um, in the Indian language Hindi, uh, which has this four-way phonation contrast for consonants. So it has uh, voiced unaspirated stops. Bal. It has voiceless unaspirated stops. Pal. And then two different kinds of aspiration. One is a voiceless aspirated stop. Pal. And then a voiced aspirated stop. Pal. And hopefully you should be able to hear that kind of mo or breathy voice quality to the um, voiced aspiration in this one. Pal. As, Pal. as compared to this. Pal. Um, yeah, there's a lot in here. Uh, I'll play some more examples from this and then show you one little fun trick. Dal. Tal. Tal. Yeah, um, so these are dental stops in Hindi. These are retroflex stops in Hindi. Um, in Hindi. So that's a contrast that we don't have natively in English. Uh, and another contrast that doesn't exist natively in English is between a voiced unaspirated stop and a voiceless unaspirated stop. So if you're like me and a native speaker of English, even though you know what's going on, if you listen to these four, um, you will have no idea what's going on. Dal. Dal, dal, dal. And they probably all sound alike to you. Um, little babies, even if they're born in an English speaking environment, can pick up on these contrasts. Dal, dal, 
dal, dal. But if nobody around you uses those meaningfully in any way, by the time you're 10 months old, you just like, forget it, uh, I'm moving on. Uh, and we lose it, but we can kind of pick it back up with the study of phonetics, right? So that's fun. Uh, and that's why we're here. Uh, so I'll give you one other random thing. Um, breathy voice segments can um, depress the tone on a following segment. Um, this, is an, our, this is a set of examples from the language Tonga, uh, which is spoken in South Africa and Mozambique. Um, so this is a tone language. Um, I've got sequences of uh, low and high tones here. I'll play these in the sort of plain, what's labeled as plain or modal voice quality first. Makala. And I think it's pretty easy to hear the sequence of tones there. Uh, you get similar sequences of tones here on the breathy voiced, um, after the breathy voiced nasals at the beginning of these words. Uh, but you might notice that the low, uh, or both the low and the high tones are a little bit lower uh, after they follow this breathy voiced segment. Maga, meho, nongo. So I'll compare them crosswise here. So here's the modal voice. Makala, maga. A little bit lower, right? And this is the high tone. Meno, meho. So on and so forth. Um, these uh, voice stops in general can tend to depress the tones um, that follow them more than voiceless stops. Some people think that uh, this is where, well, there's reason to believe rather that this is where tones may come from originally uh, as they may be sort of misinterpretations of the aspiration contrasts on preceding stops, uh, that sort of thing. So low tones might generally follow like voiced stops or breathy voice stops. Uh, high tones might follow um, aspirated or voiceless stops. Um, and the trick is that nobody really knows why. Nobody has a great explanation for why this is the case. Uh, so if you are interested in you know, doing further research uh, on this sort of thing, there's lots of uh, open room available for you. Uh, but just so you know, there's a connection there. Um, also, uh, from I want to point out another measure we can um, get for voice quality's sake. Uh, this is something you can uh, derive from uh, waveforms that we uh, collect in EGG, uh, where you can calculate what's called the open quotient for any particular voicing cycle. This is a fairly uh, intuitive um, measure, I think. So you basically measure the amount of time the glottis is open during one EGG cycle, and then you divide it by the entire period of the voicing cycle. So from one closure peak to the next, how much time is the glottis actually open uh, during that cycle? And what these measures show is that there are also reliable differences in the uh, open quotient values between the three primary voicing types. So between modal, creaky, and breathy, um, breathy voicing will have the highest open quotient, which only stands to reason because you're kind of relaxing the vocal folds in the horizontal dimension and you're keeping them open um, as much as you can. Creaky voicing, you're trying to push them together more. So that has a low open quotient and then modal voicing again is in the happy medium the Goldilocks zone between those two. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the way you can think about that. If this is one period from one closure peak to the next, uh, how much of that is open? Something like that uh, is gonna be your open phase. Uh, and you can just kind of calculate the percentage of this out of that amount of time. Um, I think I've got, yeah. A measure a typical open quotient for modal voicing will be about 0.5 which is nice because again modal voicing is always kind of the average and 0.5 is right in the middle of 0 and 1 which are our limits on in this case uh, since this is a percentage measure um, I've got this example of tense voice here where you're pushing the vocal folds together more tightly so less of that um, glottal pulse cycle is going to be spent in the open phase it's a smaller percentage uh, between this peak and that peak. Um, and what you typically get is a lower open quotient. In this particular case, I think I uh, calculated an actual value of about 0.3 or 30% of the um, cycle uh, is open uh, rather than closed in some fashion. So more medial, medial compression, the lower your open quotient is gonna be. The less medial compression, the higher your open quotient is gonna be. Um, yeah, I've got a measure here of creaky voice, which is all supposed to have a low open quotient, but I wasn't able to get a good um, measure of it because the repetitions were so sporadic. So instead, I'll just give you 
uh, an example of breathy voice open quotient, which is about 0.65 or greater. So like 65% of the time in breathy voice, your uh, vocal folds are actually open uh, rather than closed. Okay, so we have measures of jitter, shimmer, and harmonics to noise ratio, which you can get from the acoustic record. Open quotient is a way to distinguish between um, voice qualities, which you can basically only get from an EGG record. Uh, but those are four different measures you can get to help you distinguish the various types. Although normally it's not super hard to pick them out of a spectrogram in general. Breathy voice is similar to another voice quality called whispery voice. Uh, so when you whisper, like whis or whatever, whispery voice, um, the cartilaginous glottis remains open, but the ligamental glottis is closed. So air can flow through the opening kind of at the back of the uh, larynx with a hiss, basically like this, right? Uh, yeah, so that's what you do when you whisper, and it's another reason why it's kind of helpful to distinguish between medial compression and adductive tension. Uh, so you're not going to have adductive tension here so much, but you will have moderate to high medial compression when you whisper. You will have moderate airflow so that air can actually get through this gap at the back of your throat. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the longitudinal tension is because you're not getting any sort of F0. The vocal folds are not actually vibrating when you produce this voice quality. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we all, I think, uh, have the ability to whisper and pull it out every now and then when we need to say something quietly. Uh, so um, that's just a natural feature of human speech. Another feature of speech, which you may or may not have, depending on sort of the health and quality of your vocal folds at the moment, is a nodule, uh, which is a very common voice disorder. Uh, so this is basically uh, a callus-like bump that can form on the uh, vocal, uh, one, either of the vocal folds or maybe both of them. Uh, and it's a common result of overuse of the vocal folds or sort of misuse of the vocal folds because um, like, you know, the skin on your fingers or hands or whatever, if you use them a lot, uh, they get a bit tough to kind of protect themselves. Um, it's more, it's helpful when you have, you know, calluses on your hands because they don't feel like they can get damaged quite as easily. But if you have a uh, nodule on your vocal folds, it's problematic because they can stop um, vibrating properly uh, because they can't really make um, contact uh, appro uh, appropriately. And as I say this, I'm losing my voice. So here's um, an endoscopic picture of what nodules look like on the vocal folds. I'll show you a video here in a second as well. But there are these little callus-like bumps on the edges of the vocal folds. And so this um, speaker is going to be able to make contact here. But it's, like these are inflexible kind of portions of the vocal folds, right? Because they're kind of tough. <clears throat> uh, through overuse, so they won't be flexible enough to kind of allow um, closure of the other parts of the vocal folds too. Uh, and as you might expect, because we're only getting partial closure of the vocal folds, and we're getting a lot of opening in the vocal folds on top of that, we'll get maybe what sounds like a little bit of voicing, but mostly it's just a whispery uh, voice quality on top of that. Um, that's the question I normally ask in class, but I'm just going to tell you the answer before I even ask the question. And then if I can find it, I will show you the video. Yeah. So this is a speaker who has this nodule on her vocal folds here, and this is what she sounds like. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, air coming through these gaps that don't close when she phonates. Um, and I think you've probably heard somebody somewhere down the line who sounds like this, and that's probably what's going on uh, with their vocal folds. Uh, so as far as I know, um, in a dramatic case, you can um, try to remove the nodule on the vocal fold, although that's kind of dangerous. Supposedly, Wikipedia told me that the singer Jane, uh, Julie Andrews, like Mary Poppins, uh, sound of music, like when she got into her later stages of her career, she had a vocal fold nodule and wanted to get it removed through surgery. And the um, the surgeon botched the surgery uh, and like left her without any singing voice at all, which is kind of terrible to think about. I need to confirm that because that's like a very sad story. I shouldn't just throw it around, but surely we can trust Wikipedia, right? Um, if you don't want to get it removed by surgery, uh, I think the other uh, prescription is to just rest your voice as much as possible and eventually the callus kind of like 
subsides and you get flexible vocal folds again. Otherwise, you sound like this. Yeah, so she has a very loaded F0 range for that reason. Um, yeah. Last but not least, I'll give you this. This is me, if you can believe it. Yeah, that's me trying to show you my range. This is 10 years ago or so, so it's probably it was probably better back then than it is now. Now that I'm a bit older, uh, I was able to go down a little bit below 100 hertz and get kind of close to 700 hertz at the top end. But what's kind of fun is that it's not, well, I'm not a trained vocalist by any means. Um, it wasn't super easy for me to do this in a linear fashion, even though that's what I was trying. Uh, and I also kind of have to kick it into a different voice quality here at the end, which you might recognize. Uh... Yeah, so this is called falsetto. So down here, maybe I get a little creaky, but in the middle, I'm mostly modal. And eventually, by the time I get to the end, uh, that's what's referred to as a falsetto voice, um, which is maybe how most men or male singers try to hit the high notes in whatever music that they're you know, required to sing. Most music is pitched pretty much higher than an average male F0 because there's not a lot of leeway in uh, notes when you get down to like 120 hertz uh, in the typical Western musical scale. Uh, so if you are a male singer, you usually have to be able to sing um, consider high, considerably higher than um, in terms of F0 than oh, where you speak. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm going to play this one or two more times. Maybe I'll turn it up again a bit, not to show off, but just so you can sort of focus on um, an interesting effect that you get when I do get into falsetto. So listen closely at that falsetto portion and maybe you'll hear something different in my voice quality. Uh... You might notice uh, that it kind of sounds like a tea kettle brewing at the tail end there, uh, basically because it becomes a more breathy voice quality. There's more air kind of escaping through my vocal folds when I get to that super high pitch. Uh, and it sounds like noise increasing in the background as I raise my F0. Uh... Isn't that funny? So more uh, air is escaping through my vocal folds as I produce this voice quality. Uh, the, the laryngeal specifications for falsetto are supposed to be kind of high on all accounts, so you got to have high longitudinal tension to get that super high F0. It's at the top end of your range. You get high adductive tension because you don't want the vocal folds to kind of um, get too far apart from each other. If you need to get that high F0, they kind of have to go back and forth quite quickly. Uh, they're also going to be very thin, right, with high longitudinal tension, so that'll enable them to pop open and closed quite quickly. Um, high medial compression. Um, can't remember where I picked up this fact, but you get contraction of the thyroarytenoids, uh, which bring the arytenoids a little bit closer to the thyroid. Uh, and would shorten up the vocal folds, but you still get a lot of tension to give you that F0. Lower airflow than in modal voicing, so you don't pop them open too far, uh, and they can come back quickly. Uh, because they're thin, a smaller amount of airflow will bring them back together to get you the repetition of that F0 cycle. So that's the one part of this that's low rather than high. Um, and the results, like I said, are very high F0. Because the vocal folds are so thin, you get a very thin area of contact between the vocal folds and air can escape through them uh, relatively quickly during that open phase, uh, which, um, as far as I understand it, is where you get that sort of breathy voice quality for falsetto. Uh, but obviously, not to torture you again with this, uh, even though I'm singing a relatively high note in soprano range or whatever, I do not actually sound like a female soprano. Uh, there's more going on than just the F0 match uh, to sing that note. Uh... And part of that is the change in voice quality, as well as say the differences in um, form and structure between like male and female speakers. Okay, so that's falsetto. If you look at a falsetto EGG waveform, what you get is nice. It's actually as sinusoidal as anything is um, when you produce an FG or an EGG. I uh, don't know where FG came from. Um, so modal voice again is kind of peaked at the top and the bottom, but falsetto is almost basically a sine wave because you're kind of tightening up the vocal folds so much 
that you don't get that kind of out of phase factor that we saw when we looked at the lecture before where the tops and the bottoms of the vocal folds are opening and closing out of phase with each other. The more the thinner they get, the more the entire vocal fold is able to kind of operate in unison with itself uh, and the more sine wavy it's going to look. So you're not getting kind of this interesting um, high frequency changes in the EGG waveform. You're getting primarily the fundamental harmonic um, information uh, when you produce this sort of voice quality. And that will show up on the spectrogram as well. Okay, so just to sum up, these are all the facts that I told you throughout this lecture. With modal voice quality, you're kind of in the middle on all four scores, adductive tension, longitudinal tension, medial compression, and airflow. If you are producing tense voice, you will tend to crank up the tension uh, in terms of the horizontal dimension for medial compression and inductive tension, and you need to get the airflow to be higher as well to be able to still pop open your vocal folds. If you're producing creaky voice, you also want the midline um, or medial compression to be higher. However, longitudinal tension is going to be lower and airflow is going to be lower because your F0 tends to be a lot lower with creaky voice than with tense voice. Tense voice, the F0 kind of matches up with modal. Uh, with whisper, uh, you are producing relatively um, high medial compression to close off the ligamental glottis. You have low adductive tension to keep the cartilaginous glottis open. And airflow is moderate because you're just pumping air through that gap at the back of your larynx. Uh, and it sounds breathy. And breathy differs because longitudinal tension actually gets involved. You can change the F0 for that one. With whispery voice, you're not using F0 at all, so this doesn't matter. But with breathy voice, it can go up and down. Otherwise, you're not pushing too hard towards the middle, and you're cranking up the airflow so that you still get the vocal folds to come together to some extent. Falsetto, uh, these first three uh, laryngeal forces all, are all cranked up high. Um, adductive tension push the vocal folds towards each other. Longitudinal tension stretch them out a lot. Um, and medial compression as well, but you keep the airflow low so that you're able to pop open the vocal folds quickly and get them to come back together quickly as well. That gives you the highest F0 you can get in whatever your F0 range happens to be. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about voice quality. Um, we're going to apply what we have learned about voice quality to an analysis of Korean stops in sort of the next homework, and I'm going to give you a short lecture about that to kind of wrap up this section. Uh, right before the midterm, so that'll be the topic of the next lecture. Uh, and then after that, we'll move on to talking about less laryngeal things and uh, vowels and consonants and fun stuff like that. So I'm going to stop for now, uh, and I'll see you next time, which will be tomorrow for me and then hopefully soon for you.